Hi, Melissa. Hi, Sam. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, whoever else is there that I can't see. Hey. Hi, darling. Hi. <laughs> How are you feeling? Leah's here too. She was waving. Hey, Leah. Bye, Leah. Bye, Leah. How are you feeling? Me? Yeah. I'm feeling real good. Good. Thank you. Is that is that me, Bob? The household chores? Well, he's always been good at helping. <laughs> He's a military man, don't you know? He's a what-a-what-a? -what -a? Oh, what-a-what-a. He's a military man, don't you know? You better believe it. He can do anything. Talk good about me, Melissa. I will, Bob. I will. I'll, I'll talk you up. There you go. There you go. I need some help. I thought so. <laughs> it rises, yes, sir. Somebody's got to show you some love. Oh. I show him love. Where is it? Okay. No, I didn't think about this. I legs <laughs> down here. Listen here. Thank you turning around there, so I got me. I know. Okay. Hey, Bob. Yeah. You get that smoker fix? Huh? You get that smoker fix? Yeah. Yeah, it works pretty good now. <laughs> Boy, that thing was sure full of spider webs, though. Oh yeah, that yeah. They're famous for that. Yeah. I don't know why spiders like them so well. Is that that artist sitting over there? Hmm. Huh? I said, is that that artist sitting over there by Sam? Oh. Dan? Is that Dan? Uh Dan's sitting there, yeah. He's an artist. He has the oh, patience yeah. of Job. Oh, I just do paper, I know. Somebody else figured it out. I just She was 13 years old, and her dad has had, I think the number is now 28 different live-ins, girlfriends, and wives since then. Holy cow. Um, one of the longer ones, um, the one that, that, I, that he was with whenever I met him uh, was named Mona. Uh, they were together for... 15, 20 years almost, something like that. Yeah. 
Most up until just before. Mo oh, did you think Mona? I I didn't no. know where that was. So it was probably was at least ten to ten to fifteen years. But but uh, he was with her, and um, her children went to school with Melissa. So she knows Melissa knows her, her grandson and I were born the same day. Her yeah, her grandson and Melissa were born the same day. So they they kind of know each other. Um, so, I mean, while I'm not any real relation to her, I've been around her most of my life, and there's some kind of a weird relationship Chip. there. I mean, if, if, I don't know if I've ever say it got to a friendship level because she was kind of no, old, was... scary, and mean. <laughs> I didn't know anybody's family life sounded stranger than mine, but apparently yours qualifies. <laughs> hey, our nuclear family is pretty normal, but you yeah. get beyond that and it starts getting really weird really quick. Well, my father had three wives and five kids. All at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> he probably would have thought about that. He would have tried it. And then I have three half brothers, one half sister, and four stepsisters on that side. My mother had two children, another child, another girl, and she had three husbands and eight children, all but the same man except the first one. So I, I almost need a, a list to keep up with people. Sounds like you do too. Are you there, Sam? He's gone. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I think he's making a list for me. <laughs> he was awful quiet there. I didn't know if he was making a list or if we lost you or what happened to you. I don't know that my family is as odd as yours is, Sharon. Um, but I mean, it. Well, it sounds like it. I mean, uh, different, not odd. Different. Different, yeah. Well, and the reality is that different only makes sense if you have a definition of what normal is. And let's face it, what what's normal, really? Robert and me. <laughs> Boy, that's a broad statement. No pressure there, Robert. No. Well, I had an uncle that had three wives, and I don't know how many Libyans. And then he remarried one of the wives three or four times. Didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So I think all of us has got. Well, I just got really confused because I pulled out what I thought was my bookmark, only to find it in First Corinthians with a date from 2017. <laughs> and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. So I, I was I was really confused all of a sudden. You don't look confused. Oh, trust me, we're dealing with revelation. I'm absolutely confused. <laughs> no, we're counting on you to know what you're talking about. I am learning what I'm talking about, but I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, that works. As well, I told, I've got two Bibles open here, so I'm going to keep up with you one way or the other. As I told them uh, before you guys hopped on, I learned something today I had never understood. Hmm. And it just didn't make sense to me until today. Uh, and uh, we're, we're at, we'll wait here just a second. But um, I was studying about the literature of the book of Revelation, what kind of writing style it is. And it is absolutely uh, apocalyptic. But it's not fully <laughs> apocalyptic either. Um, because realistically, 
It is a vision. And, and the word apocalyptic is really... <laughs> what do you guys... Oh, you're trying the gummy bears? Get him. Um, hey, Jim's going to get on tonight. Happy birthday, Jim! <laughs> yep, Happy it's Jim's birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, Jim. Look, and Don's going to get to join. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Hey, Don. <laughs> you did make it, Don. <laughs> having a good time. Well, according to one, one of the notes in my Bible says, apocalyptic literature seeks to reveal divine mysteries that would otherwise remain hidden. So why isn't it apocalyptic? Well, I was just going to give an advertisement. These are Albanese gummy bears. They're made in Maryville up near Chicago. And I think they are my absolute favorite gummy bears right now because they have a really good flavor. And the sour ones, it says start sour and stay sour. And it's true. It is very true. Watch your reaction. Just watch it. So. I want one. <laughs> I have regular ones. You have to come trick or treating because that's what I put in this. She got the non sour ones for the oh, trunk or treat. So. So. All right. Well, it is five after by the clock, and I am going to go ahead and say a prayer because we're going to actually jump into scripture tonight, and there is a lot of things to see and figure out. So uh, let's pray. God, we thank you for being with us all throughout this day, for carrying us through the low points, for celebrating with us in the high points, and Lord, just for showering your blessings upon us. Lord, I pray that you would meet us in this moment, that you would make yourself known through your word, and Lord, that we would honor you by all that we say and do. Reveal yourself to us, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So what I was saying, and actually this is important to our study, is um, the book of Revelation is actually three different kinds of literature. It is apocalyptic, but we actually, that's, that's not a very good term for it, because uh, apocalyptic comes from the Greek word apocalyptos, which is the word to make known, to reveal. Literally, apocalyptic is the revelation. They're the same word. Um, apocalyptic literature tends to be literature that points to something that is coming, that is yet to come, that is here but not fully here, it is something that is being revealed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a sense in which, by its pure name, being the book of Revelation, it is something that is being made known. It, it, you don't have to necessarily understand it at the beginning, but as you read it, by the end of it, it should necessarily make sense then. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that's kind of silly, but I, I had never thought of it that way. The second thing is, this is an epistle. Just like the letters of Paul, just like the letters of Peter, we just studied 1 Peter. This is an epistle because John is writing to specific people. At the very beginning of his letter, uh, in uh, verses 4 through 8, he is introducing himself and talking about his audience. And at the very end of it, he ends by ending the way most other letters do. There is a greeting and a blessing as he goes. But the other thing about this is, and this is what was really revealing to me, um, this is a cyclical piece. And what I mean by that is it's not a cycling piece. 
it's literally we are stepping into a vision. And, you know, we tend to read this in a chronological fashion. This happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And yet, as I was telling them, at the very onset, we get this picture of the messenger from God comes, and immediately what happens? John falls on his face, and the angel tells him, don't worship me, don't, I'm just the messenger. And... And so we have then the rest of the book, and at the very end of it, you get Paul, or not Paul, you get John in front of the, the angel again, the messenger, <laughs> falling on his face. Well, to us, that seems weird. Why in the world would, would he be told at the very beginning, don't fall down and worship me, and then at the very end, he falls down and worships him? Because... It's, it's not two different instances. It's a single instance. Um, have you ever been to a planetarium? You know what I'm talking about? I was trying to use the, I, I've never been in one of, they, they've got what they call cyclical rooms where you step in and it's a diorama all the way around. It's one. How do you image. spell that word? Uh, Which one? Cyclical. That's why what? It's C-Y, C-L-I-C-A-L, is that right? C, no. oh, like a cycle. Uh, cycle, cyclical cyclorama, it's C-Y-C-L-O-R-A-M-A. Holy cow. And so, literally, because we only see, we see about 180 degrees, really good people with good vision see about 270 degrees, um, but the thing of it is, is we can't take in the full picture. It's just kind of like what you guys see on the screen. You guys can't see Bonnie sitting over there. You can't see Mark sitting over there. You can see Dan. You can see Hannah. You can't see Madison. Can't see Jake. You can't see Leah and Melissa in the other room. You can only see part of the picture. And yet there's stuff going around on all around us, right? And so John is stepping into this vision and he's describing what he's seeing. But the thing of it is, is we tend to think linearly, right? Right. This was written, then this is written, then this is written. So they must be happening in that order. But actually what he's doing is he's writing this part of the scene and then he's writing this part of the scene and then he's writing this part of the scene and then he's writing this part of the scene. And, of the scene. and so it starts with, John at the foot of the messenger, and after he's written about the entire vision, it ends with him at the foot of the messenger. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Like there's, like there's so much going on, like <laughs> a painting in the Last Supper, but like there's so much going on that you can't explain it all at once. Exactly. That's what the book I, we of couldn't Revelation hear what she said. She said it's kind of like if you took a painting like the uh, Da Vinci's The Last Supper. There's so much going on in that painting. You can see just the broad overview of what's happening. But if you start looking close, you start seeing different things. And all of a sudden, the bigger picture gets even bigger because all these little parts of the picture make so much more sense. Right. And so there is, a, there is this cyclorama style of writing that's going on in that these are not events that are happening chronologically. This is one vision happening all at once. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, part of it, I mean, for instance, the last thing John writes down is about the consummation of heaven and earth, the new Jerusalem. I think there is a sense in which we would all agree there is a futurism to that. That is yet to come. But some of these other things are happening at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. And we'll discuss that as we unpack it and as we move forward. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. And so this isn't purely prophecy. You know, we tend to associate apocalyptic literature with prophecy. The book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, they have apocalyptic natures. They are revealing things that are yet to come. But you can't put 
Old Testament prophecy in the same category as you put Revelation. Old Testament prophecy is looking forward to the point of Christ. This is New Testament prophecy. This is Christ has come, now what? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But you try and say, well, we use Daniel or Ezekiel to make sense of Revelation. Okay, that might inform it, but you can't say it's a direct correlation. Because the big precipitating event, Jesus, has happened. Does that make sense? You also can't say that the book of Revelation is just an epistle. I mean, because a lot of the things that you normally find in one of the letters, the epistles, isn't here. I mean, there is an admonition. We, we start with these, this letter to the seven churches, and, and John is writing about things that they should do and not do and how they should live and not live. There's definitely a discipleship piece to this. That's the epistle. But more than anything else, it is this vision that is what's going on. Does that make sense? And so, any questions about that before we actually hop into the text? Because I've, I've really started to get kind of excited about it now that it's starting to make sense to me. So, with that, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 1, and uh, for me, the first paragraph is verses 1 through 3, okay? Um, and I'm reading out of the New, New International Version currently, so um, if you got other versions, we'll look at those as well. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So, what do you notice in this? What what stands out to you? You want to pause the music in there? Okay. What do you guys notice? What stands out? Do you what's the difference between reading aloud and just reading? If you're reading it to yourself, it's about you. If you're reading aloud, it is meant for any and all who hear. Because my my version in verse three it says, "Blessed are those, blessed is the one who reads aloud the word." So I just read it. it's more of everyone needs to hear this instead of it's for your own personal gain. This <laughs> this book is not just about. Your personal gain, yeah. Well, because so. all of the letters that were written were to the church of, and it was read out loud to the church to address their issues. So this is them saying it's still for everybody. You know, there's a, a false notion within especially American Christianity that says you can have an individual faith. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. False notion that you can have an individual faith. Faith was never meant to be false? done individually. What, you, what was that, Sharon? Why do, you, why do you think it's false? Because as Hannah was just saying, and as we're seeing here in the introduction to Revelation, it was always meant to be done in community. Letters were written to the church, to the people, to the gathering. The word for church is actually ecclesia, which is more like the word congregation. It's to the congregation of Ephesus. It's to the people that make up that congregation. Every single book was written to the people, not to a person. And even the book of Luke and Acts, which are sponsored by Theophilus, 
it, he, this one guy paid Luke to do it, but it's not really written to Theophilus. It's written to the church as a whole. It's just it's written to the church by way of Theophilus. And so there's become this notion that because we all have our own copy of the Bible, and because we all have to make a personal decision for Jesus, that faith becomes personal. It's just me and God, and that's all that really matters. But nowhere do you find that teaching uh, in Jesus doesn't say that in the Gospels. Nowhere do you find that in Paul's writings. Nowhere do you find that in Peter's writings, in the book of James. Nowhere is faith made to be individualistic. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mean, if we take go back to the very beginning of the story, what's the first thing that God says about Adam? That boy's going to be lonesome. It's not good for him to be alone. Exactly. From the beginning, we were meant for community. And faith is meant to be done in community. And so right here from the beginning, it's saying, it's not just about you reading this letter for yourself. Read it for yourself, sure, but read it for everyone else. Take it to heart. But take it to heart within the community. Make sure that as you are reading it, you are reading it for others as well, that they are hearing it. It was meant to be done within the community of believers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Never had thought about it that way, but you're right. The other it thing makes I want sense. What, what you got? You got another? It makes sense, but... In the NIV, uh -huh. blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, comma, and blessed are those who hear it. So even though I agree it's meant for community, I think it can be individual, but that comma is not here in New King James. New King James says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. But the comma is here in the other translation. I feel like, okay, if we've got a person who is alone, literally, um, way out in the country a hundred years ago, blessed is that person who reads, but also blessed are the people who hear. Did that work? I, I think it's it's both and. Okay. It's not an either or. Uh, it's not just enough to read this. You also have to hear and understand it. <laughs> it's not that. just enough to read this by yourself. It also has to be done in community. Or and it needs I think, to be. Or it needs to be, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that comma is kind of a misnomer. Uh, it's there for the sake of English grammar, uh, but it's probably better suited if it was a semicolon. Okay. Because, right? You would have an and. The and is showing in front. A semicolon is that still apart. Well, and in the Greek, it, that and is very, very prevalent. Okay. I think I think it's it's meant to be a both and here, as opposed to a neither or. Because the semicolon was showing those two completely separate thoughts that seem to be connected, but and really shows that coordination. <laughs> the angel's name isn't important. There's other places in the Bible they tell you that. Sometimes. But very actually less often than than, not, than more often. I think sometimes it's just like the, the angel wants to introduce himself. Sometimes, like I mean, if you're doing a nice task for someone, it's not always that you think to introduce yourself. Like, <laughs> I think maybe there's something about the angel; they just automatically know who it is. 
no, not necessarily. I think in the times when Scripture gives us the name of the messenger, uh, there's a significance in that. You know, for instance, Gabriel is seen as the leader of the, the angels of knowledge. And so this isn't just some lower level angel being bringing this message to Mary. This is the highest one who's given this task. Also, all of the named angels, like their name means something. Yes. But in this instance, the messenger is not what's important. The message. Is the important. message is what's important. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. And and to be honest with you, that's that's why I think they use the term angel because angel literally just means messenger. They're following in the Hebrew understanding of what's going on here. Um, that when we use the term angel, we immediately think that this is a divine, this is a spiritual being, and therefore this is a spiritual message. But the, the, the reality is, rarely is the fact that we have a spiritual being bringing the message as important as the message that is being brought. Does that make sense? So with the word message, messenger there, you might think it's a human form and not a spiritual one. Essentially, yes. Um, there was another thing. Uh, where's that? So I, I was also looking at the Greek here. There's a, an interesting thing. Um, in the English, especially the new. The international version, it says, uh, just the first line, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what soon must take place. That is a packed full sentence. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask with like, we talked about like the different millennial positions and all right. that stuff. He says what must soon take place at the end, he says, because the time is near. Like, he makes it sound like it's going to happen tomorrow, and we need to be ready for it. Well, the interesting thing is the word soon is not in the Greek. So he's really just saying, showing his hands what must take place. Um, it's, this is about what is being ordered. So it's going to happen. They added soon. They the added soon to kind of get at the emphaticness of what the Greek says. Where is the word soon? At, uh, in verse the NIV, it's verse mm -hmm. one, the first sentence, at the very end of the first sentence. What was that? I was just trying to help. I said, what, what must soon take place? Yeah, what it says, what yes. must soon take place. Uh, and, and literally, when, when um, what the Greek says saying. is, this is the unveiling of the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus, which uh, God has given to him, meaning Jesus. This is the revelation that the Father gave to the Son, in order to show his slaves, his servants, of that which he is, he is out of ordering, must be making to happen quickly. So soon was implied. Soon is implied, but it's, it's, so, um, let me use the let me use a different idea to kind of get at this. So when when COVID hit and everything got shut down, right? Um, how we operated as a church just completely changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were things that we still did, but there were other things that we couldn't do. There was a lot of things that we used to do that we just didn't worry about. They were complete 
Some of them were put on the back burner. Some of them were taken off the stove altogether. But the moment we got the message that said, hey, you can open back up in a limited capacity on June 14th. All of a sudden, a lot of things that weren't on the stove got put back on the stove. Things that were on the counter got put on the stove. A lot of things had to happen right away to make sure that we were ready to come back into person. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which this revelation is Jesus has just ascended into heaven, and now God's saying, okay, that phase is over. Here's the next one. You get what I'm saying? There's a sense in which this is right after Jesus ascended into heaven at the end of the Gospels. You get what I'm saying? So some of it is happening immediately. There is an ordering that is going on, an unfolding of revealing of what God is doing in the world. Does that make sense? Uh, Don. Oh, you, you've got to get leave. We are recording this, Don, so you will be able to see the rest of it. Good. Thank you. And we'll see you in two weeks, too. Uh, Go ahead. At the beginning of it, you said the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mine says the revelation from Jesus Christ. Same idea. <laughs> I think that probably the revelation from Jesus Christ makes a whole lot more sense. Oh. It's like the revelation of Jesus Christ, like but he's here. No, 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 it's it's his revelation. Like he's no. doing the revealing. Um, I just take it to you. Of Jesus. You know, is the party coming? They, the revelation <laughs> of Jesus Christ is more of a possessive. But of implies a possession, that Jesus is the one who has it. From okay. implies a delivery. Well, thanks for calling. Does that make sense? Both are probably accurate, okay. and it's probably actually both of them. Okay. Okay? Yep, All right. Any other thoughts? I mean, we could dig in a lot more into this, but we can also move on if you don't have any other questions. So I, I want to say that these three verses are what make this an apocalyptic text. It is the revealing of what God is doing in the world. That's literally, like I said... The first word in Greek is apocalyptic. It's the revelation, the uncovering, the unveiling, unveiling. They're all one word. Then we move into, at verse 4, we get this epistle greeting. This is kind of what makes it the letter. So I'll read the next. It's, I guess I will go 1 through 8 or 4 through 8. It says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has by us... And, and has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve God and to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming in with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Oh, 
Um, it, it's, that's used actually in the Gospel of John as well. Um, and we're going to see that, that phraseology come up a couple more times throughout. And, and I think the interesting thing here is that cyclorama concept that I gave you guys at, at the beginning is already happening right here in this section. There are three things going on all at once. Uh, you have John saying that he's writing this letter to the churches. Uh, you know, you see, you have John speaking of the fact that he is seeing this vision. Look, he's coming with the clouds. And you have Jesus speaking all kind of happening simultaneously. We read them sequentially, but this is the greeting. This is the start of this letter. Does that make sense? Our mind has to look at it somewhat line linearly. Is that how you say that? Linear. In a linear fashion. In a linear fashion. <laughs> Thank you. But the reality is, it's all happening in this moment. Okay, so um, you keep, like, over the years, you have said that God wants us to be disciples of Christ. Right. But here it's saying that um, he has made us to become a kingdom and priests to serve. Correct. So are we priests? Yes. And disciples and members of the kingdom. And servants. We're servants. Too. And servants. <laughs> Here's the thing. And your children. Your children. There is Child. no one word that describes what God wants for you. If there was one word that summed it up, that would overly simplify the profound nature of God's plan for your life. And that's true for all of us. Um, I use the term disciple because for me, it kind of encompasses all those things. But the reality is, it is all of those things. We are a disciple. We are students of Jesus. We are apostles. We are the ones who are sent out with this message of Jesus. I mean, just like we said there at the beginning, it's not just about the people who read it, but also the people who hear it. And, of course, it wasn't for, but for the last hundred years that people read in their head. You were taught to read out loud. And so it's about proclaiming. It's about hearing. It's about receiving. It's about being a citizen of this kingdom. But it's also about us being priests where our reading and hearing of this message helps other people get connected to God. That's what a priest's job is, is to connect people with God. And so it's all of it together. So it's kind of like being tutored and tutoring at the exact same time. Yes. Actually, yeah. absolutely. It's like a no. student tutoring another student. You're she so said it's like being someone. tutored and tutoring someone else at the same time. Okay. You know, the reality is none of us are there yet. I mean, I've been a pastor for 17 years, and like I said, today I learned something new. I a big, profound learning for me, just today. I mean, you guys, we've each been on our journeys with God for a long time, and yet we're not there yet. We are little Christs. That's what Christian means, little Christ, but we are not Christ-like yet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so John is kind of giving us, I don't know if John would have written, if John had just kind of come to this truth over time, I don't think he would have wrote this down. You know what I'm saying? If this is just his journals from his years of being a, a disciple and apostle of Christ, and, you know, here he is, he's older in age, and and he's been through all this stuff. He's writing down his memoirs. I don't know that that's what this would be. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus came and met him and said, this is what you're doing. This is what's happening. You're writing this down. 
<laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, John, you're going to see something. It's not going to make sense, but just write it down anyway. Just write it down anyway. And like, we'll, we'll figure it out when we're done, okay? It's like having your very confusing dream and you're trying not to forget it. But like, so you're like writing it down it really quickly. But trying then, to puzzle it together and it not making sense at the time that you're puzzling it together. And, and, and you know, that's the reality of visions. If you, if you look throughout human history, if you look at the Old Testament, when, I mean, what exactly did Ezekiel see when he saw wheels inside of wheels? I mean, he doesn't know. He's trying to figure it out, but he's more concerned with writing it down, so he gets it down to make sense of it. Uh, there is a nun who had the profound vision, and she said she wrote it down immediately, she was also a painter and an artist, so she spent the next 20 years drawing pictures and painting pictures, and, and then after 20 years, she went back and rewrote the dream down and then tried to take it all and make sense of it. Because the thing about a vision is you can't take it all in. You just can't. Um, you know, I imagine one of the most startling things of recent history is can you imagine what it must have been like to be in downtown New York City on September 11th, 2001? I mean, for Madison, she can't even imagine that because that's before her existence. That was before she was born. I mean, I remember watching the news and trying to figure out what was going on as they were reporting on it. And I still don't fully comprehend, but it, could you imagine being down there in the midst of it? You can't, I mean, you, you might take in what was going on at one tower, but have no clue of what was going on in another tower. Or you might be, have an understanding of what's going on in New York, but you had no clue of what happened in DC or in Pennsylvania. And yet they're all linked together. They're all, part of the same event. Um, listen, can you grab my phone, John? And these reporters were kind of doing the same thing that John was doing. Like, they were just trying to get out what they understood of what was going on around them. Exactly. Like, just frantically, this is going on, this is going on, but, like, I don't yeah. understand what's going on, but, like, this is what I see. also seeing, like, all of these things were going on, and they were just trying to, like, get out what they could see at any given time. And so we need to bring that reality to this book that we're getting ready to read. John is writing it down linearly because that's how you have to write things down. But this is a single vision of a whole lot of stuff happening all at once. And right here at the beginning, Jesus comes into it and very clearly says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who was, who is, and who is to come, the Almighty. I realize I read that out of order, but, but I think part of what, right here you have a summation of what this book is really about. I've always said it's the revelation of Jesus. It is a revealing of what is happening, but more than that, it's not meant to be something to that causes us fear, that causes us to worry. We should approach this book as if we got to get this figured out, because if we don't get this figured out, everything's going to be, we're, we're going to miss it. Jesus says right up from the beginning, I am the beginning and I'm the end. I've got this. I am the one who was. I mean, Jesus came and lived in the world. But I'm also the one who is right here in front of you right now showing this to you. And I'm also the one who is to come. I'm the one who's going to make all this stuff happen. And so I, I used to joke whenever people ask me, and, and you've heard, um, if you've been around Christians talking about the book of Revelation, you know, are you a pre-trib, are you a mid-trib, are you a post-trib? Well, I'm a pan-trib. It all pans out in the end. You know, that's a joke, but, and it's, it's funny, but 
right here in verse 8, Jesus is saying that very fact. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I, yes, I am the one who was with you here on this earth. Yes, I'm the one who is with you in this moment. And I will be with you at the end of this when it all finishes. So don't worry. It's going to be okay. Does that make sense? I have something and I don't know if it's just okay. like a translation thing, which is why I'm mentioning it to you. Yep. In verse 4, it says, from the seven spirits before his throne. <laughs> Hold on. So mine says, from the seven spirits. But there's also a footnote that it could be the sevenfold spirit, and spirit is capitalized. So, this letter is written, it says, to seven churches. Now, it actually says these seven churches in the province of Asia. How many churches are in the province of Asia? There were more than seven, weren't there? I mean, were there not bare, bare minimum, there was at least eight because he doesn't write one to the church in Colossae. And we know that there was a church in Colossae because Paul wrote a letter to that church. <laughs> seven. Is it because seven was the perfect number? So it's, it's exactly because it's seven is, is the number of completeness. It's the number of perfection. Mm -hmm. And so literally, on the one hand, while John is writing this to these seven churches, and that he will mention by name, He's also writing it to the churches, all the churches, every church, everywhere, at all times, in all places, because they need to know about this revelation. Whatever I was saying, like, I can imagine him, like, eating money on to figure out which church is going to <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's literally just about seven specific churches, then, yeah, all of a sudden you've got to play, as Hannah was saying, you've got to play eeny, meeny, miny, moe to decide who you're going to leave out. Oh, they already got one. <laughs> they already got one. They don't need another one. But yet, Ephesus gets Ephesus in. Ephesus got one. Ephesus got one before, and John's including them in this one, you know. So, well, they must really need it. We're going to include them again. They apparently didn't get it. Paul already wrote two letters to Corinth. We don't need to include them either. They're fine. You know. I get the idea. There is a sense in which this is to these seven specific churches, but it, the number seven being the number of completeness also means it's to the entire church. Which is part of the reason why the book of Revelation has stayed a part of the Bible. It was up for debate. Almost every time that there's ever been an opportunity to kick it out, people were trying to kick this book out. You think because it's so hard to understand? Yeah. I think because yeah, I don't... I, I think it's not because it's hard to understand. It's because it's hard to understand it within our current context. There's, there's a reality in which every generation has to look at this book and say, okay, what was John saying back then? What did it mean to them? What does it mean to me now? And what will it mean in the, in the future? Because there's definitely some of this that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And so because it's got this complex system of pictures, I think a lot of people really struggled with the book. But on top of that, a sad reality, as I was doing some research, um, I found out the book of Revelation is the first book that is used by the first heretics of Christianity. Really? The, the Montanists were what they were called, and they were the first group that the church was like, no, 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 you guys are off. You guys are just weirdos. That's not what Jesus meant. And they actually believed that the book of Revelation was about them, and it was going to happen where they were, and they interpreted everything all of the Gospels, all of the Old Testament, everything through the lens of Revelation. Hmm. Hadn't thought about that. And they were before the me generation. 
they were before the me generation. We're talking, you know, like yeah. early on, early, like 100, 110s, 120s. Like, and, and anyone that reads a book knows you got to read the beginning and middle before you read the end. Otherwise, it's really confusing. And I bet they were probably confused. And that's why they thought we were weirdos. Because they didn't understand. But yet, we all also know people today, Christians today, who read the Gospels and the Old Testament through Revelation. They're looking for revelation to make sense. They're wanting the timeline of revelation to be now. And so everything that comes before it has to be read through it. We all know people like that. We've all experienced some people like that. We all know someone like that probably who's in our church. I'm not going to name any names. But you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Have you met people who the book of Revelation is all that there is? And that's all that's important? So from its earliest era, the book of Revelation was almost tossed out because these Montanists kept using it to spread a different version of Christianity. So because there are so many different interpretations of Revelation, it has struggled to keep its spot at the table. Does that make sense? And yet, right here at the beginning in these first eight verses, we've already got a sense in which what it's about. This is about Jesus, who has been given the message of what God the Father is doing, and he has been told by the Father to bring it to his servants, and it is about those things, just what you said there, Madison, that reality of a kingdom and a priesthood. It's about a message of what does it mean to be in this kingdom? What does it mean to be God's priests? You know, what does it mean to live out discipleship in the world in the midst of all this that's going on? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, it says, him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. But, like, they use the term forever and ever, like, a lot in the church. Uh-huh. But the thing is, though, if forever is forever, then why do you need to <clears throat> emphasis and ever? Just, it's the emphasis. It's the idea that it's longer than forever. It's, it's really just for emphasis. So, I want to no. go back and look at verse 5 a little bit. Because our English translations cause us to lose something. It, uh, verse 5 in mind, I realize this is in the middle of a sentence, but it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. There are four different things said in that. First of all, we're talking about Jesus Christ, right? And, of course, we understand Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the one that the Old Testament was pointing to. So that puts a, a context here, right? I mean, we just think of that naturally, but we need to remember that John is writing from a Greek island in the Greek language about a Hebrew reality. You get what I'm saying there? The second thing is, who is the faithful witness? Now, to be honest with you, that is a really not a helpful translation. Because the word faithful witness is actually the word martyr. It does very Hi. How you doing, girly? Bill's got his girls Hi, with him. Um, yeah, the word martyr carries with it a connotation, doesn't it? The, but the word martyr means one who is willing to testify to the truth no matter the costs. 
So faithful witness gets at it, yes. But witness seems not intense enough. Exactly. <laughs> A faithful witness doesn't have the the bravado that martyr, that martyr does. Literally, Jesus is the first martyr for the truth of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. So if he is the faithful witness, he is the, the martyr for the, for the ministry, and he is the firstborn of the dead, that firstborn implies what? There will be more. There will be more, right? And by us being a recipient of this letter, we are one of those more. Martyrdom implies tribulation. Exactly. And so from the beginning, Jesus is, John is saying, this is about the Jewish Messiah, the anointed one who was to come. This is about the one who was persecuted and killed, who received tribulation and yet he is the one, the firstborn of those who are going to do it, that he is the one who is the ruler of the kings of this earth, and so he is more than everything that we experience around us, um, and that we are patiently waiting for the fulfillment of everything that Jesus promised. So right here in the beginning, John is already saying, we are in the tribulation. Remember how two weeks ago I said I wasn't for sure where I stood? Well, I do now. John is telling us. From my perspective, John is saying, we are those who are to be martyrs, faithful witnesses. I'll take the lower version of it for us. <laughs> but yet, we are part of the kingdom we are called to be priests. You know, that question you were asking, Madison, is absolutely true. All of that is built right here into the introduction. So this vision is to proclaim these realities. It's going to show us how Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the one who was prophesied. He is the one who has come. And he is the one who is going to come again. This vision is about being faithful witnesses, the martyrdom, the testimony of what Christ has done, what Christ is doing, and what Christ will do. This vision is about how he is the firstborn of the dead. It's about the resurrection. It is about the resurrection that is to come for all of us. And it's also about how Jesus is the king of, of all the kings. He is the ruler of all the kings and over all the earth. And so this vision, as we look at these scenes of the vision, are going to all tell us those things. Does that make sense? The introduction really sets the stage of what we're going to see in the rest of this vision. And it's kind of this call to a radical discipleship as citizens of God's new Jerusalem that we're going to see at the very end while we're living in the midst of this fallen Babylon world. We're going to hear about what the fallen Babylon looks like, what it's like to be in this fallen Babylon world. We're going to see about this new kingdom, the new Jerusalem that is to come and what it means to be a citizen of that. And in the midst of it, we're going to hear about what does it mean to be a disciple, to live out this kind of life within these two realities. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Like the greeting in doxology, it says John comma, and then it starts. Is that like that's like him saying, "Hey, saying John." Yeah. No. 
No, because a lot of the letters would start like, is John saying, hey, I'm the one writing the letter. Or Paul. Uh, to oh, the church of, us. yeah. Yeah, it's just him acknowledging this one. He's like, hey, I like this. But like, now we can just keep it up here. I mean, he's. You want to hop into the next section? Yeah, we can go a little longer. I used to do an hour and a half on Wednesday nights, right, guys? <laughs> you used to do two hours. Oh, the time is sometimes, yeah, longer. Well, I, I told you we would get through the first chapter today, so I'm going to try and do that. So let's let's read this next section. And I'll read it all as a chunk. I know I normally try to take a paragraph at a time, but let's read this whole section as a chunk. So uh, Revelation 1, 9 through 20. It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. Among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his foot, and with a gold sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like br bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So there's a lot going on here, but what do you want to try and unpack? Verse 19 is literally Jesus saying, hey, write this down. Yeah, verse 19 is, write it down. My favorite thing is that he's like, hey, write this down, and this is what it means. <laughs> like, he kind of interprets it for him. Like It's like the teacher the saying, saying the churches, it's, like, it's literally like the teacher that you're like, Literally, Jesus is saying, write this down. Don't take time to process it because there's too much going on here. I'll explain it as we go. We'll see a little bit. Write it down. We'll talk about it. We'll exactly. Here's a PowerPoint. You know. <laughs> Just copy it down exactly. Let's let's take a chunk at a time. So nine through eleven, um, right here, verse nine. John is again doing that summary. I, John, your brother and companion in suffering. So tribulation, right here at the beginning, and the kingdom, and patient endurance that is ours in Jesus. He's already telling us again. What are the three things he's going to talk about? Suffering, suffering, the kingdom, and patience, and patient endurance. Living the godly life in the midst of this new kingdom while there's suffering going on all around us. Uh, he was on the island of Patmos because he was there on this prison island for all intents and purposes because of the word of God and the fact that he was teaching about God. He was martyring. He was doing the work of a martyr for Jesus. He just didn't have to give his life. 
It says that you, like, on the Lord's Day, he was in the spirit. Do you think that he's saying that he was in, like, prayer or, like, meditation or, like, completely, like, out or, like... Yes. I know. I'm saying all of it. I'm saying that he was doing what he does every day in that he was praying and meditating and and doing what God has called him to do. And in that moment, as he was doing that, he was also taken into this vision. For all intents and purposes, this is kind of an out-of-body experience. I mean, realistically. So John, John, all of a sudden, he's like, oh, wait a, wait a second. I'm, I'm here, but I'm also there. And I'm praying, and I'm doing what I normally do on Sunday. But, and then he hears a voice, and he turns around, and immediately there's Jesus. I mean, this is all like, oh, okay. This is not your standard. This is happening. This is, this is happening. This is happening, exactly. <laughs> this is happening. Yes. To me, it's like him being overtaken by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Another fine, you know, phraseology that we've used for this. I think there's a lot of truth in that. Any other Why thoughts? Be Go ahead. Why behind? Why behind? Mm -hmm. I heard behind me a loud oh, voice. Again, what do you think? Remember that? That uh, picture I tried to paint of the of the planetarium of the, mm -hmm. the dome. Mm -hmm. I think there's a sense in which God came behind him because if John was just all of a sudden confronted with the reality of the post ascension Christ, I'm not for sure he could have taken it in. Okay, that makes sense. I think it's kind of like if you're like in a really dark room and like your eyes are open and then so suddenly someone turns on the lights and it's so bright and you can't see. That's like that way to be good. Way. Yes. Okay, back here. I think it, it's both of what Madison and Hannah have said. It It's kind of gave, Jesus is giving John an opportunity to get his bearings before he's confronted with the complete reality of who Jesus is. I, I, it, you know, it's kind of like, um, do you remember back in Exodus whenever Moses says, I want to see you, God, and God says, if you see me, you will be undone. Yes, that makes sense. So, so you can, I'll, I'll put my hand over you and I'll let you see my back so that you get to see my glory, but, but I don't want to undo you. And so John kind of has this, oh, crap, I'm not. I'm not the way things were just a second ago, but yet, where am I? And in that moment, Jesus says, hey, John, and gives him a second to, he gives him a second to turn around and take it in without being just confronted with it all at once. That makes sense. I like that. Did you hear that? Sometimes. It's like when the, your friend uh, calls or, or texts and says, hey, we're in town and we're stopping by. Throwing things. Yes. Okay, so that makes sense. There's a sense in which John was not prepared for, I mean, he's praying, he's meditating, he's doing what a person does on the Lord's Day. He's anticipating encountering God. But he's not expecting it like this. But yeah, he's not expecting it to this extent. He's not expecting it to tap him on the shoulder and be like, hey, come do this. <laughs> you know, okay, that makes sense. He's expecting the warm fuzzies of the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit and God the Father and God the Son it's all like, in one moment saying, like we are here. It's like expecting a love tap and then smack. <laughs> we brought the whole family with us. We brought the whole family with us. We're calling, uh, hey, we're Yes, I realize we live four hours away, but uh, we are in town, and it's everybody. It's all the aunts, the uncles, the cousins. It's everybody. We're here. Right. 
And you have 10 minutes. And, and, yeah, and, you have 10 minutes. And actually, for John, it's you've got 30 seconds to turn around and experience it all. <laughs> And, and then just so that he doesn't get overwhelmed, just so that he doesn't get so overwhelmed with the reality of Jesus, as Hannah said, Jesus says, oh, write this down. Yeah. Don't get overwhelmed with the experience. Just write it down so that you've got something to do that, you, that allows you to handle this. Just fumbling with a piece of paper. Really so I can't take Jesus in, but I can write things down. I'll I'll write it down good, Jesus. I'll I'll do that. Keep my head down. You, you get what I'm saying? Yes, that yeah. makes sense. And so, um, which then you get verses 12 through 16, which is John's bumbling way to try and explain Jesus in this moment. <laughs> there were these lampstands, and there was this guy in a robe. He was kind of shiny. And... <laughs> he's, like, oh, he's, to the story. Yes. Like, he's, he's, the story. he's He's got yeah. a beard, and he's got white hair, but I didn't look at him in the face, but his feet, man, his feet were shiny. And his feet were shiny. He had some stars and a sword. <laughs> you know, it's... Oh my gosh, it is Max. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> making fun of Madison in here, but yet we have determined that apparently Madison and John the Apostle are, have, a, very have a kindred a spirit and a kindred way of doing things. <laughs> Madison and John and me and Peter. Mm -mm. <laughs> like they're just like <laughs> rambling off. He's rambling off what he sees, but it doesn't really make sense and he knows it doesn't make sense yet, but like, he's got to write it, it down. Really I kind of get it. I don't understand it really, but do you get it? I get it. I get it really. Yeah. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know why I'm doing it. Yes. I've actually done that before. Oh, We've determined that's Madison Senior quote. Yep. I know. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I've got no clue why I'm doing it. <laughs> as long as you do it. He told me to write it down, so I'm writing it down, but I don't know why. <laughs> do you have do questions you about any of the symbolism here, or do we need to let the symbolism be, or? I mean, Jesus does make some of it make sense. He's like, John, I know you're wondering about it. Those seven stars, well, they're the seven spirits to the churches. And the seven lampstands, those are the church. We'll get back to that. We're coming back to it. Don't get too caught on guard by that. I'm bringing it to you. I think... Verse 17, at least in the New International Version, is the most appropriate response I could ever imagine. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Thank you. Not even like worshiping him, I just collapsed. I, could, I couldn't handle it. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't handle it. I didn't even have the wherewithal to try and worship him. I just, boom, just I'm done. Done, done. It's, it is what it is. Jesus, this is, you made me this way, you, this is what you get. And then Jesus, like, puts his hand on me, he's like, hey, buddy, get up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, buddy, get up. You got lots to write yet. You, you, you don't have time to be down on the floor. I love that, because he, it says, he's like, he's got his hand on me. It says, do not be afraid. He's like, no, no, come on. This is okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great image. You know. Like, he's helping him up. It's more of like a companion kind of thing than I'm better, not better than you, but like. Yes, I know I'm bigger than you, I'm God, but it's okay. In this moment, just get up. Jesus it's... is just being personal. He's like, come on, friend, I'll help you. Don't be afraid. <laughs> yeah, I'm the first and the last. I get that. I'm, I'm God, and it, and that's a little overwhelming. But get up. <laughs> and I, yeah, I know I was dead and I'm, I'm alive. But... See, you don't need to freak out. I'm, I'm fine. You're fine. But it's okay. <laughs> I've got the keys to hell and death. I'm bigger than this, and you need to not be afraid. And you need to help off the ground because <laughs> you got things to write down. I think that's so beautiful that he's being reassured. You have a dream, you wake up. You don't remember all the details. He's going to forget this. You don't do it right, right this minute. You need to write this down because you don't have a whole lot of time here. And if I try and explain this all to you and you just try and be all fangirl about it and living in the moment. Then it's you're, like you're parents 
are you're going to forget things. It's like parents trying to record their child doing something, but they're too focused on recording it instead of like experiencing, experiencing, experiencing it. it. Yep. What do you say, Sharon? It's wonderful that we that he recognized the need of John to be reassured. Absolutely. Jesus lived a human life and he knew he would have known anyhow, but he knew from experience how John must be feeling. And and here's the interesting thing. At verse 20, for all intents and purposes, that's the end of the vision. You get verses 19 and 20 is Jesus saying, okay, you've seen this. Now write it down. And just to kind of explain a couple of things, this is what the stars mean and this is what the lamps. Everything from chapter 2 through chapter 22 is the vision all at once. I think it's talking about lampstands that look like the ones that are described in the temple. So they were, it's like, you know what a candlestick looks like? They're just really tall. It's a candelabra. And, and that right there was my big revelation. That verse 19 and 20 is John coming out of the vision. I thought that the, the, all, everything from here on is just a linear progression of a vision. But the reality is Jesus saying, okay, the vision's over. You can get up off the ground and now write this down. Kind of like uh, those brain games where like, they flash something at you and then like, close your eyes and try and picture it again. That's exactly what it is. But like, so and, by verse 20, he's already stood in his room and spun around. And now Jesus is saying... Now you're going to write it down. Yep. That's the thing that has eluded me to making sense of all of this. If you, if you just got through chapter one, you would actually have everything you need. John, John tells what's happening. He tells where he was at. He tells what he's going to talk about. Jesus says those very same things and explains that this is what's happening. This is who I am. This is what's important. This is what you need to know. This is what you're going to see. G uh, John writes down this description of Jesus and what he experienced in that moment. Jesus gives him a description of what that means, what these two things he's holding is. Literally, Jesus is saying, I am holding the spirit of the churches, those who are preaching to the churches, the angels, the messengers to the churches. I'm holding all of the preachers, and I'm holding all of the church, and in the midst of this tribulation, and in the midst of everything that's going nuts, understand, I've got this, and we're good. And if you didn't have any of the rest of it, you would get the message of the book of Revelation. And I think Jesus being there telling him, hey, pay attention, Kind of helps because if you just tell a kid to go like spin around in a circle and close your eyes and then tell them to tell you what's in the room, they're not going to be able to tell you. Maybe tell them. But if you say, hey, hey, it's like Sean Spencer. They haven't had time to And that's exactly what it is. So you, John is worshiping on Sunday. It's just another Sunday. He's he's praying. He's meditating. He's worshiping God. A messenger, an angel comes and says, "Hey, John, come on, we're going." And immediately he's taken into this vision and he hears Jesus and he turns around and he sees Jesus and he sees all this stuff. And then literally, probably, you know, Sharon, for your science fiction notion, he goes immediately back into that second where he was just praying and worshiping God as if nothing else had happened. No time was lost for John the per person. And yet, in the midst of that nanosecond, we get the rest of the book. You're, you're making a weird face, Hannah. What's up? <laughs> I know your brain. Well, that's what I'm telling you. I, finally, for me, it all made sense. Whereas, 
for me, it, this book has broke my brain for 20 years. Because I kept trying to think that this was an ongoing thing, an unfolding so, timeline. You used the planetarium for your example. In my mind, it was one of those pictures in the round where you, you're in inside of this thing and you're going around to get the whole picture. And yes, it's both. It's, it is the panorama, it's the picture of the round. It's the, it's the uh, planetarium, it's all of that kind of imagery mm -hmm. to get into the reality that everything else from this book is going to be happening in the split second between the messenger tapping John on the shoulder and Jesus saying, okay, get up off the ground and now write down. So when he falls at his feet, is the dead, that's him like snapping back into where he was at? Basically, yes. Mm -hmm. That works. <laughs> And, and if you have that understanding, then now, as we move forward, do you get the sense of all of what we're about ready to experience? This isn't something to be afraid of. This isn't something that is necessarily there to frighten us. This is Jesus loving humanity enough to say, okay, John, I want you to write down what is actually happening in the world so that they don't have to worry about it because it, it's been 30 years since Jesus ascended into heaven at this point. And there's probably a lot of people who are wondering, did that really happen back then? Was that really real? Did we just make that up? And Jesus is saying, no, you didn't make that up. It was real. And I have been working and I am working and I've got things that are coming, and it's good. It helps that Jesus told John that this was coming, but it's also, like, it doesn't help. It's going to be, like, a form of panic, but then there's also going to be, a, like, a form of calm. I feel like for him it was more, like, awe than panic. Overwhelming awe. Overwhelming. Like, even now, it's, it's Which an is, overwhelming thought. Here's the thing. Overwhelming awe is exactly what worship is meant to bring. Like when he felt like he was dead. Do you get that? That worship is about ascribing the worth of God to God. Trying that there is a sense in which worship should bring us into the enormity of God. And yet in that very personal way that, hey, John. It's okay, you can get up. It's like the little kid that fell over and is crying, but like they don't know why they're crying and they can't get up. Yep. That's that's so they're it. Just they're them. crying and they're on the ground, but they don't know why they're crying and they don't know why they're on the ground. Okay, so the parents like, get up. Come on. Let's go. And and so I know we're not gonna meet next week, but I hope that I hope that you'll read over this chapter uh, maybe a couple times between now and then. And if you want to try and read ahead, feel free to. But understand that we're reading, if you read ahead, we're reading about this big circular vision, this big vision that's going on all around John that he's trying to piece together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And again, don't let yourself, even if you, that image of it being a, a vision in the round, you know, don't even try and let yourself think about going around in a circle as if it's this and this and this and this and this. It's it's bouncing all over the place. It's it's this catches his attention out of the corner of his eye, so he comes over here and he deals with this, and then that catches his attention over there, and he goes over and he deals with that, and then he hears a trumpet back there, and so he turns around and he deals with that. Squirrel. It's very much a squirrel moment. I'm listening to you. I was reminded of a Three Ring Circus with everything going on at the same time. Of course, you're in the audience at the circus, but if you were down there and everything is going on at the same time, maybe? That, that is a really neat image for it as well. Um, you know, for the, pe 
for the participants in the three ring circus, they know what their part is and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing in their ring. For the audience, there are three different things going on at once. But imagine how much more intense it would be if you were an audience member who all of a sudden was standing down there in the midst of the three rings. And you're just trying to take it all in. It's just chaos. And you're trying to take it all in. And in this moment, the tiger is right in front of you, but then all of a sudden the elephant's back there, and then there's a clown over there, and it's that's mm-hmm. that's the sense I get of this book. Yes, it's it's brought to us in chunks. I mean, that's the only way that you can tell it. But that's the only exactly. That's the only way our human brain can take it in. Which means it's the only way that his human brain could process it. Exactly. And therefore, we don't see time all at once like God does. So, in this sense, it is a historical fact. It is happening. It was happening for John's time, and it's happening in our time. It is. It is kind of like God, eternally present. There is a reality of this that is ongoing. I, I told you, Sharon, you made me pin myself to that chart. I absolutely am a historicist. And now that I've got this understanding, I believe that. There's a sense in which there is a cyclical nature of this. We will see ourselves in all of these churches. There's a sense in which we will see ourselves in in living in the Babylon. And there's a sense in which we can see ourselves moving to the new Jerusalem. All of them are, all of this is happening in this moment. And eternally, it is finished as well. Does that make sense? It's almost a metaphor of the fact that we all accept as fact, and we, none of us understand it, that um, time is not chronological for God. That's how it is, among many other things, that he knows what's going to happen. Exactly. It's all now. This is the mystery of reality. That... God is both in time and with us and eternally present with us. The Holy Spirit is with each and every human being all at once and everywhere. But yet he is also beyond time and beyond space and beyond our finite lives. And, and, and that's the mystery of it. And actually that's the beauty of it too. That all of a sudden, if we have this as our starting point, if we understand that this is what we're getting ready to step into, then I think we, it's less about us figuring it out and pinpointing the timeline on a map and figuring out where is this new Jerusalem and where is the new Babylon and what sea is the beast coming out of and and where is all this happening And instead, it's more about us experiencing it for what God is unveiling to us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not about the when, it's about the what. Exactly. It is not about the when, it's about the what. and, And it's about the who. It's about how God is moving through all of this. And that's yep. probably a good place to stop before our brains melt anymore. <laughs> yeah, mine's about melted. <laughs> so with that, I think we can do like John. We started, and let's pray. Let's end in prayer, too. Pick ourselves up off the floor, put our brains back <laughs> in our heads, and now let's go to the Lord. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for, man, just the neatness of this revelation that you want us to see you, to hear from you, to know you, to experience you. Lord, that you love us enough in spite of our brokenness to invite us into your story, to make us part of your kingdom, and to give us the joyful task of being your priests to help other people get to know you as well. Lord, I pray as we journey through this book, Lord, that you would just continue to unveil yourself to us, to continue to make yourself known. And Lord, may we live lives that glorify you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. I'm going to stop the recording. So see you in two weeks. I will see you guys in two weeks. Yes. Okay. Okay.